it is eight o'clock, which is the official start time of our event this evening. So I am gonna go ahead and kick us off uh, and say a big hello to everybody who has joined us. Um, I see that lots of folks are coming in still. Uh, so no worries if you're just joining us. We are really excited to have you all. Um, I will start us off with a brief introduction. Um, I'll give you a little preview of what you can expect this evening. And then we will get started um, as all things should start with a little bit of drinking. So uh, first of all, thank you so much everyone for tuning in this evening for our special date night spring fling theme. Uh, this is a new program that we are trying out here at the museum. And this is the first installment of what is hopefully many to come. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, trying something new with us. Um, we hope it's going to be a fun time. My name is Talia. I'm the Virtual Experiences Coordinator at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Um, I am so excited to get to be your host and your moderator this evening. So I'm not going to be talking science. I am going to be talking smack because that's my main job. Um, but my, my big job tonight is to keep the show moving and to introduce you to all of the fine folks who are here to share their expertise. So uh, we have a rock star crew with us tonight. Patrick Hartnett is our Director of Food and Beverage at the museum. Uh, we're going to hear also from our curator of ornithology, Dr. Garth Spellman. Uh, we're going to hear from our director of no research and collections science. You're called the science division now, uh, Dr. Gabriela Chavaria. Uh, <laughs> she is going to talk with us. Uh, Garth and Gabby are going to tell us about the birds and the bees. See, there's a little bit of a theme here. We're going to get a chance to do a craft. You're going you're to learn how to make your very own bird feeder from uh, materials and things that you probably already have in your own home. Uh, we're going to play a little trivia game uh, that I cooked up. And then our poet master, Franklin, uh, is going to read us some poetry. And if time allows, uh, we'll even walk you through writing some poetry of your very own that you can use to woo your love bird or your honey. So we are in for a really exciting evening tonight. And again, a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Uh, without any further ado, um, actually, a little bit more further ado, I forgot one thing. Uh, if you haven't already done so, take a moment to type in the chat and say hi. Uh, let us know where you're watching from this evening. Uh, maybe you're doing a little bit of 8 p.m. howling before we get started. Uh, maybe you're sitting outside on your patio. Maybe you've already got a cocktail. Maybe you've got your special friend next to you. Maybe you've got a cat or dog. I mean, that's what I got with me tonight, uh, hanging out with you too. Um, we always love to know who is talking to us and who is watching along. So send us a chat to say hi. Um, I will be watching the chat all night. So any questions that you have for our experts, any comments that you want to share, we do encourage you to get a little bit saucy for this date night. So feel free to pop those in the chat at any time. Um, it's great to have you all. All right, without any further ado for real this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Patrick. So Patrick, you have got something real exciting going on with us this evening. Tell us about what we're gonna be doing. Hi, welcome to my house. Um, we're gonna be making a drink I call Devils and Angels. And it's a whiskey sours, but it has little variations and some fun garnishes you can make at home. I believe so everyone has the recipes. And I'm just gonna walk you through how to go how to do those, right? So <clears throat> local asparagus, we talked about, it can be substituted with green beans. Um, what you wanna do is blanch the asparagus or beans in salted water, chill them, and then put on, uh, pour over your, um, your brine. <clears throat> and then someone asked if you could do this quickly. Yes, cut down the acidity, put in some local honey, read your label, make sure it is actually local. And then, um, you know, make it as spicy as you want experiment with different uh, spices and different flavors. That's the fun thing as well as the honey, um, just experiment. Uh, now, and then the next thing we have are candied jalapenos. This is a recipe I came up with years ago. Um, it's a great way to save your jalapenos. That Talia said that when they get a little bit old, slice them, cook them in simple syrup until they're um, just translucent and then dump them into a bowl of cane sugar. So, I just had this cane sugar that uh, that these came out of, and it, you can see it's fluffy and it's got a bunch of jalapeno juice in it, just enough to make it to where it can rim a glass really well with some smoked salt. So those are our three garnishes, and then um, we're gonna make our sours mix. Never buy sours mix at, at the store. It has uh, first ingredient citric acid or like a vitamin C pill. Um, and you really shouldn't be drinking that much vitamin C. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna uh, get our juicer, juice a couple. For my sours mix, I like lemons, limes, oranges. We have tangerines here today, mandarins. Um, you can use anything. 
whenever you do taste it because it's an agricultural product and one orange is not going to taste like the other orange. So squeeze all your citrus, never buy it. And then we're going to mix up our, so our uh, sour mix, right? So here's our citrus mixture. We're going to put it in a cup. Look at that precision. Huh? Look at that precision. Pour that into a mixer. And then uh, this is our jalapeno simple syrup that we cook the jalapenos in from the candy jalapenos, right? So let's put about four ounces of that in. Two to one is my preference. You may like it a little sweeter uh, or a little more tart. Uh, it's up to you. This is not World Baking Championship, which you would need recipes for. <laughs> Shake it up. Now we have our sour mix. If this makes a screeching noise, I apologize. <laughs> metal to metal. So the next thing we're going to do is make our drink. We're going to mix in some ice in our mixer cup. I put enough ice in for two drinks because you don't want to water it down um, with a bunch of ice. You want these flavors. So we're using uh, me uh, Mythologies American Whiskey today. We like the folks in Mythology. They gave us some hand sanitizer. Uh, there we go. I'm gonna pour in. I like the equal part uh, for this. And of course, that is just how it came out. The sweetness of those citrus. And uh, so that's yeah, how it came out. Now, we'll be mixing this up. Let it sit. We're gonna rim our glasses now. So I took some of the sours mix, or juice, either one, put it on a plate, and get your sugar out there, okay? Got a little bit of smoke salt, like I said. And now this jalapeno sugar is just a little, spicy and sweet and just awesome. I like to fill up about halfway. Yum. I hope everyone got a chance to make this. Now, here's the here's the fun trick. So uh We'll add some of our asparagus and some of our little halos. Now, we have pencil asparagus here. Uh, so medium or larger asparagus might be a little nicer. But there's your devil's horns with little halos. And a delicious drink for date nights. Try it with barbecues too. Really good. Cheers. Oh my gosh, it's so good. I'm so jealous now that I, I yeah, I'm with Garth. Where was our care package with all of these ingredients? Um, <laughs> but that just means, you know what? I now have uh, an exciting weekend ahead of me of learning how to make this cocktail and pickling asparagus. Um, and I see lots of comments in the chat uh, saying, yum, cheers, cheers, yum, so delicious. So very, very well done. Sounds like it was a hit. Um, if anyone has any questions for Patrick, we would love to take those for you. Susie is asking for the recipe. Susie, that recipe went out in a reminder email to our audience before the event. Um, and Susie, I know who you are. Um, so we will make sure that we get you that recipe. So as a reminder to everyone, um, if, uh, if you would like to make this again another time, uh, you do have that recipe in your email inbox. Um, if you need that recipe again, um, I welcome you to send us a message to virtual at dmns.org um, if you need that recipe sent again or to membership, I believe, at dmns.org. Someone will be able to help you out. We are happy to oblige. Um, all right. Oh, question from Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. If you were going to add three splurge bottles to your home bar, 
what would they be? Oh gosh, <clears throat> um, I'm, a, I'm a champagne fan. So, you know, Biff Pico is a, is a splurge for us. Um, uh, Chambord has a diversity that I love. You can use it in desserts, fancy drinks. Um, so Chambord would be something. And then uh, Grand Marnier, of course. Very good. That was a great question. Um, Andrew says that they used a small batch whiskey. Highly recommended. Awesome. Uh, well, we do need to keep this show moving. We have a jam-packed evening ahead of us. So a big round of applause for Patrick. Thank you for your incredible talents. And again, I'm so jealous. My mouth is literally watering. Um, we are going to move on next. Um, and I'm going to stop spotlighting your video so that we can see everybody in gallery view. Uh, we are going to move on next uh, to a brief presentation from Dr. Garth Spellman, who is our curator of ornithology. He's going to tell us a little bit about birds. Because you know, birds, bees, educated fleas. We don't we don't have any educated fleas tonight, but we do definitely have birds. So, Dr. Spellman, Garth, uh, dude in the ring neck pheasant shirt, unmute yourself and take it away. I think I might need to unmute you. Oh, you got it. There we go. I got it. Do I need to share my screen now? Uh, if you are ready to share your screen, go ahead and do it. Otherwise, if you have any opening remarks, you can make those now. Oh, absolutely. All right. So thank you everyone for coming. It is a pleasure to be joining you today. I am actually um, not in Denver. I'm in Fargo, North Dakota this evening uh, because I needed some assistance with my three kids with my parents. So I am here and having fun. They're at a fireworks uh, display that's going on in Fargo, a remote distancing fireworks display, so I shouldn't be interrupted. But I'm really here to talk to you and I'm happy to talk to, to you today. And I'm gonna talk about, of course, the season of love and the birds of the bees. And, you know, I, I know that I talk to a lot of people at this time of year and, you know, they're so excited. They see birds nesting, they see birds singing and pairing up. And we get these romantic visions in our head and we try to anthropomorphize what's going on with uh, animals. And so, I want to touch a little bit as I start going on on really sort of the social psychology that humans have for love and commitment and and also what leads to sex ultimately. And so there are models that have been developed. Some are four dimensional. I'm going to use a three dimensional model uh, to talk about human um, interaction and human connection. And you have three sort of axes. You've got a passion, commitment, and intimacy. And as you go across these axes, that's axes, that's where you get certain types, right, of relationships and pairings. You can have romantic love, compassionate, fatuous love, empty love, where it's all commitment, but you get nothing in return. And ultimately, where all three of the, the um, axes come together in the middle, you have that consummate love that you can have. Well, and, you know, that, get, that brings us to, you know, these ideas that we have and the ideals that we have around human relationships. And we sort of apply those sometimes to animals. And I like to sort of debunk those myths because really what we see out there, especially with the birds and the bees, is really this is all about sex and offspring. So if we take a look at that triangle, we could probably reduce it down, right, to really only two axes. And if we do reduce that down, we can actually use those two axes to look at bird mating systems. And we can plot them on that. And I like to call this the avian sexual system vector. And so our two axes that we have on there are passion and commitment. And as you can see, passion decreases dramatically as we have more commitment. And along this axis, you get, at the top, you get promiscuity, when it's all about getting business done. And that's it, that's all you want to do. And as we move down to, like, in, to increase commitment, with less past passion, we start to get in a male multiple or mating with multiple females with polygyny. So, or a female mating with multiple males, polyandry. So, and then 
social monogamy we get to. Then there's plain old monogamy. And at the end, there's celibacy because you are too committed to actually get involved with anyone because you're scared of all the consequences. And so this is what we really see. Now, if we were to add another access here, and that would be the intimacy access, right? We might see in birds, we actually have a curve where we have sort of the frequency of relationships and they fall on somewhere close to social monogamy and monogamy where the majority of avian relationships end up. And if you see that symbol and that plot there, it actually kind of reminds you of something. It reminds me of something. It's someone giving you the bird. So someone's flipping you off there. But anyway, we can describe, so using this, where we find these avian sexual systems. And so if we start at the very top with promiscuity, well, what happens there? What sort of things do we see and what evolves under promiscuity? Well, under promiscuity, we get the evolution of some of the, of some of the most amazing external genitalia that you might find in the animal kingdom. And it probably doesn't surprise many of you out there that these giant duck penis or giant penises are found in ducks. Well, some of uh, these, these ducks, and most ducks actually are highly promiscuous. The males will pursue females and you have unwanted penetration. So it's basically duck rape. It's not pleasant. But evolution is actually very creative and has come up with a way, natural selection has come up a way, with a way to still promote female choice and to reduce these unwanted penetrations because down here in this figure, the penis is on the right and the vagina is on the left. And if you look, these giant duck penises, they're spiky, they are spring loaded and they're corkscrewed. Well, the vagina in these ducks has evolved to be corkscrewed in the opposite direction, which makes penetration very, very difficult. And so if you have this, this give and take between the males and the females under this promiscuous um, settings. So as we move down that, that vector and we get to polygyny where we get a man, male mating with multiple females, that's where we get the evolution of some of the most uh, well-known sort of sexual structures that we see in the animal world, like the peacock's tail and the bright colors. And it even extends to, this is a satin bowerbird, and they build these elaborate structures to court females. But we have to remember that this goes with very, very little commitment when it comes to these, these, polygynous, situ these polygynous mating systems. The males build these elaborate structures, and they spend a lot of time courting females, but it's not very often that they get to mate with a female and when they do, they provide absolutely no assistance to that female. The female goes off with the sperm and the eggs fertilized and raises the young. But Typical men, am I right? Oh, not typical. Some of us are good. But you get these amazing bowers that, that they build. And then birds of paradise fall in these, in these polygynous so, uh, mating systems as well. And things like the great Argus pheasant, like the pheasant on my shirt. So this one's a little bit fancier. And then the uh, waddled umbrella birds that you find in South America. And these are spectacular displays where they inflate that giant waddle that is, that is hanging off of their neck and they spread the feathers out and call to females. So the males are certainly trying to do something, but really in the end, all they are providing is genes in this situation and nothing else. So, and also we have mating systems that have evolved in these polygynous situations like ruffs, where you have males that look very different from one another. So the independent males can have three different color morphs. So you have satellite males that sit off on the side and get females that are wandering away from Lex. And then you also have these little faders that are actually female mimics and they mate with females as they're watching um, these roughs perform on the lecking grounds. And so it's pretty spectacular. 
But we also have some of these situations in polyandrous situations where a female is mating with multiple males. And under these circumstances, it is the males that have all the parental responsibilities. They rear the young, they sit on the nests, they incubate the eggs, and they also raise the young. The females do nothing. They lay the eggs in the nests that the males build, and that's it. And in these situations, the females are often larger and more colorful. We have the same situation in three species of phalarope that we have in North America that you can actually see in Colorado. So, but as we continue to go down that, that vector of, of bird mating and bird systems, we start to get to social monogamy. And this is where commitment is more on an annual basis and under social monogamy. These are birds that pair, bond, and they mate for a breeding season, but then they will split up after that breeding season. And so many swan species fall into this category. And even in, this, in these situ situations, we can get the evolution of really dramatically beautiful plumages that we might only associate with those polygynous situations. But in these species, like kingfishers, there's some beautiful tropical kingfishers. They all, are, the males and females, are nearly equally brightly colored. So, and the colors, we believe, have to do a lot with pair bonding. Um, and in some species, like tanagers, tropical tanagers that are found in the canopy, some of these bright colors are associated with camouflage. So with the highly UV uh, light that you find in the canopy. But the males and females, and many of these species are equally brightly colored and they're providing the same amount of care for their young. We also have the same situation in this tropical bird. This is a sun bittern where the males and the females have these beautiful wing spots and beautiful plumage colors and they bond for a breeding season. And in grebes, we don't have beautiful plumage but we have these elaborate dances where pair bonding on a season, they, they dance with one another uh, in order to, fair, to, to form those pair bonds. And that kind of brings us down back to monogamy. And I'm sorry, the baby is yawning, but you know, monogamy, when it comes to that commitment, it can be relatively boring. And a lot, and, you know, the birds might find it that way too. But there are some pretty amazing displays. So many large uh, albatrosses, they, they breed for life. These are royal albatrosses from Campbell Island um, in, in the South Pacific. And they pair bond. And throughout the year, they perform these elaborate courtships with their mates. And they, they continue to do it throughout the year. It's not just something that you find in breeding season. Um, but it's taken to an extreme perhaps in another species and in another group in hornbills. This is the rufous-necked hornbill. And this is a species that does mate for life. And they, they, the males and the females, they bond and they mate for life. But during the nesting season, the female will actually enter a tree cavity that the male will lock her into and provide only a feeding hole. And it's the male that provides all the food for that female throughout that nesting period, incubation period, and rearing period. And it, sent, it feeds the female through a hole in this mud that it's locked this female into the cavity into. Um, but the females emerge, no worse for the wear, and the bond goes on. And so that for me is my little talk for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the uh, passion and commitment axes and how we can use those to look at bird mating systems from promiscuity all the way down to true monogamy. Very good. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, I did see a couple of comments in the chat uh, saying things like, oh my God, what is going on with duck penises? Um, Zoom does have this lovely uh, raise hand feature. So go ahead and raise your hand if you had no idea that you were going to be learning about duck penises this evening, because I'm willing to bet that at least a few people did not think that that was going to be happening. Um, but you know what? Here it is. 
you learned about mm -hmm. them. So thanks for hanging in there with us, everybody. That was really cool. Uh, thank you so much for that. At this point, we're going to stay on birds before we move a little bit forward into bees. Uh, and we are going to uh, switch it up with a little bit of a trivia game for you now. So I'm actually going to share my screen. We're going to play a little game called Bird is the word. Um, hopefully everybody is seeing my screen. I'm going to make sure that my chat windows are shut. Uh, we're going to play a little game for you this evening or with you this evening. Um, what you're going to see on the screen in just a few moments um, are five different common names of birds that sound a little bit funny or inappropriate. Some of them are real and some of them are not. Uh, we'll show you each name one at a time. You guess just in your head or you can even tell us in the chat uh, whether each name is real or made up. Uh, keep score in your head. Um, and I did say 30 seconds to make your guess, but in the interest of time, we're actually gonna move this along pretty quickly. So, are you ready for your first one? A masked booby. Is a masked booby a real bird or a fake bird? Take a moment. I see lots of chats coming in. Folks are saying real bird is the consensus. Oh, folks are saying, some are saying fake. We got a good split. That is a real bird. A masked booby looks a little bit like this. Uh, maybe not what you expected when you hear the word booby, but yeah, that's what they look like. They're, they're kind of fuzzy, kind of weird. I don't know. I guess real boobies could look like that too. All right, moving on. How about a bush tit? Is a bush tit a real bird or did I make it up? Some folks say in real, some say in fake yet again. Andrew says real tits. <laughs> All right, a bush tit is a real bird. This is what they look like. Kind of cute, right? I don't, I don't know what ornithologists have going on, but they're really into boobies and tits. All right, Stephanie says, yes. All right, moving on. Tell us, is a greater shag a real bird? Or a fake bird, or did I did I make this one up, or is it in fact a real species of bird? Lots of votes coming in saying fake, including one saying fakers, a few saying real. That is in fact a fake bird. However, it's not that far off because this bird that you see on your screen is in fact a European or a common shag. So yeah. We're not that far out of reality and ornithologists again still have their brains in the gutter. All right, moving on. Cock of the rock. Is a cock of the rock a real bird or a fake bird? Tell us what you think. Jennifer says real. Amanda and oh two Jennifers say real. Cameron says fake. <laughs> Ian says I hope it's real. Lots of votes saying real coming in. All right, that one is in fact a real species of bird and just wait until you see what it looks like because holy cow this has got to be among the weirdest birds i've ever seen hi colin sorry that i misidentified you oh, that is a cock of the rock uh not only is that a real bird that's what it looks like um so now you know that that's that's very exciting all right and our last one of the evening before we move on we've got next a uh crafting activity for you to make your own bird feeder how about a hoary woodpecker Hoary woodpecker. Did I make this one up or is it a real bird? Again, a good mix of false or fake and real guesses in the chat. Andrew says fake pecker. And guess what, everybody? That is a fake bird. However, again, a hairy woodpecker is a real bird. So we were not that far off to reality. All right, so how'd you do? Tell us in the chat, what was your score? We'd love to know. And in the meantime, uh, we are going to also, oh, so, sorry, Lindsay. So a couple people say not so good. Doug got 100. <laughs> Andrew says, we won. Stephanie got three out of five. You know what, everybody? Uh, it sounds like you just need to get more up to speed on your inappropriate bird names. That's all I'm saying. All right, I am gonna stick with sharing my screen. Um, and now what we would like to show you is a special activity from one of our educator performers, 
Harley. She has taken the time to record a lovely video for us about how to make a couple of different kinds of bird feeders in your very own home. So um, this should be about six or seven minutes long. And then after that, we'll hear from Gabby. We were hoping for a 45 minute program this evening. I think we're gonna go a little bit long, but again, thanks for hanging in there because we've got a lot of good stuff for you tonight. So I'm gonna share my screen and then bear with me if for some reason it doesn't work right away, but I think we should have it. All right, so here is Harley. Type in the chat to let me know if you can see her. All right, everybody can see her. All right, here we go. Hi, welcome to do-it-yourself bird feeder with Harley. For our bird feeder craft today, you will need oranges, raisins, peanut butter, oats, bird seeds. I would suggest a cutting board, a knife, some extra spoons, a couple extra plates, and an extra empty bowl. Plus, you're going to need twine, string, yarn, one nail, and some scissors. Let's make some bird feeders. So to begin, you're gonna take an orange and you're gonna cut it in half. As you can tell, these are not equal halves. <laughs> so you're gonna take your orange and you're gonna scoop out the fruit part. Oh, grab your extra bowl and do it over your extra bowl because it's really juicy. A nail and we are going to poke through the sides. Let me just put that one. Okay. Boop. And you're gonna grab your yarn and scissors. So we're gonna put our string through the hole and we're gonna tie it. Do a little extra one so that it stays secure. And we're gonna do it on this side. Put a little double knot again. There you go, see? If you want, you can use your scissors to trim these little bits off. That, we're gonna do it on this one too. So next we're going to grab that bowl that we put the innards of the orange in and we are going to grab our raisins and put like a nice handful of raisins in there. Mine are all stuck together. So I'm going to suggest breaking those up. 
Next, we're gonna grab our oats. Same thing. Put a happy portion in there. Really up to you. However you like your bird food. <clears throat> and then we're gonna put in some peanut butter. Give it a good scoop. Then you wanna stir all these ingredients together. Just like that. And then you're gonna grab your bird feeder. Right? And we're gonna scoop it in. All right, that was awesome. Uh, thank you to Harley. I don't know, maybe she is watching this evening. Uh, that was a great, very well done video. Uh, we do actually have a second part to that video that we can send out to you. Uh, so watch your email. Uh, we will be sending that along uh, to you after the event ends, perhaps tomorrow. Um, and you did also get the instructions to create that bird feeder of your very own when you registered in a reminder email earlier today. So don't worry if you missed a step or if you want to try this a little bit, a little bit later, uh, you will have the chance to do it. Um, and Andrew, I see your question and we want part two. No worries, that will be emailed to you, but in the interest of time, we are going to keep things chugging. And yes, I do see a couple people saying, I think we'll have oatmeal tomorrow. And you know what? That snack did look really good. I'm not even going to lie. That looked delicious. All right, moving on, we are going to hear next uh, from our um, Vice President for the Science Division, Dr. Gabriela Chavaria. She's going to talk with us a little bit. We heard about the birds already. The birds were all well and good. Uh, but now we're going to hear about the bees. So, Gabby, tell us what you got going on. Excellent. Thank you, Talia. And thank you, everybody that is on the screen. It's super exciting to share with you, uh, you know, all about the bees. Uh, Garth, thank you for that great introduction uh, on, you know, the different behaviors of mating uh, in birds. And, and I wanted to share with you, and I'm going to share my screen. And I wanted to start my presentation by telling you, uh, I usually, you know, most people ask me about, you know, the differences between a bee and a wasp. Uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people will call a wasp a bee and they just generalize that all wasps are bees. So, but they're not. There's a big, big difference between the two of them, as you can see on my PowerPoint. But uh, the main, main difference is that bees are strictly vegetarian. They feed on pollen and nectar, and wasps are carnivores. They feed on other insects, and that's why they come to your picnic table, because they like to taste a little bit of your ham or hot dog of whatever you're eating. But uh, bees are really unique, and we're going to be talking exclusively about bees tonight, and, and bees that pollinate, and uh, in the United States, in the world, we have about 20,000 different kinds of bees. Uh, most of them are solitary in behavior, uh, like a lot of the ones you see here in this screen. And we have a few kinds that are, you know, social, like I saw that many of you have honeybees at home. So those will be social bees, but the majority of the bees are solitary. Um, <coughs> they live, you know, in a solitary manner. And sometimes, you know, they live in aggregations, but you will see a lot of little holes and each bee will live in each hole. They like to have their own apartment, but they do like to have neighbors. So, but the diversity of bees, you know, they go from like the size of your little pinky nail to up to, you know, the large, big uh, carpenter bees uh, that, you know, we, we see a lot here in Colorado. Here in Colorado, we have about 920 different species of native bees. Uh, honeybees are not native, remember that. Uh, they came, you know, when the Europeans, Europeans came, and they are critical because they are the pollinators of our agricultural crops. So, but, you know, all of these other natives, except for bumblebees that will start, you know, a little bit social, but I'll tell you a little bit more. And we have over 20, 
20 different kinds of bumblebees here in Colorado alone. So next time you go out to your garden, just you know, pay attention and you'll see all the different kinds uh, that we have of bumblebees. But what makes a bee special? A bee is a very special because they have the famous pollen basket and that we all know since we were kids uh, because bees specialize in collecting pollen. Uh, so they have a special structures in their legs, in their hind legs, and they have this little um, cavity where they usually are able to collect the pollen. And some of them are just incredible pollen carriers, and that's what makes them the best pollinators of our plants. And, you know, um, this is a totally different talk, and so we will, you know, we'll have to come back on that. But the partnership between bees and plants and flowers is just unique. Without one of them, you know, we wouldn't have the diversity of plants that we have. So we're very lucky to have, you know, bees and the diversity of flowers that produce the amount of pollen and nectar to attract these pollinators. But tonight we're here to talk about, you know, the reproductive system and the mating behavior of bees. And this is the reproductive system of a bee, a female bee. Because unlike, you know, in birds, the majority of the bees are females. And female, they're female societies. And many of them, you know, will take care of everything from, you know, laying the eggs, taking care of the eggs, feeding the eggs, going out, collecting the pollen and the nectar, bringing it back to the nest. And you might ask, well, you know, so what's the role of the drones or of the male bees? Well, the male bees are only providing sperm uh, for the females. And so you have here, you know, these big ovaries where the eggs are hold, and then you have these special sacs uh, the spermatica, and that's where the bee stores the sperm from the male bees, because Garth uh, alluded to that, bees mate or they collect all the sperm from, you know, several males, uh, and right after the male deposits the sperm, uh, the male dies. Uh, so, yes, you know, that's why we have these, you know, female societies. And the bee, the female bee, has the capacity to decide if she's going to produce a queen, if she's going to produce another uh, male bee, or if she's going to produce worker, uh, sterile workers for the colony. So, um, I love this scene, and I'm going to try to do this quickly, because I wanted to share this really quick video uh, I know a lot of you that have bees uh, at home, you probably have seen this behavior, uh, which is, you know, the nuptial, the famous nuptial flight that honeybees have when, you know, when is that time of the year when they're pollinating, when they're mating. So the colonies shift to reproductives, they produce males, they produce females, and then the males, the drones, you know, they follow these queens, and in order to make them. And of course, there's so many males, they're all fighting to get to the queen. And, you know, and so they can, you know, pollinate, they can fertilize her. There's a successful drone. Um, Abby, I don't think we're seeing the video, if that's what you're wanting to be narrating at the moment, or maybe you were oh gonna God. pull it up in a moment. So we might, I, I remember earlier, you needed to switch something on your side. Um, but while you're working on that, I will just share, there we go. So we may just need to back it up to the beginning. Uh, we have lots of uh, excited reactions in the chat. So lots of folks think this is very exciting. All right, take it away. So this is the queen and the, not, the famous nuptial fly that we all have heard for, you know, since we were little. And so there's a certain time during the year, usually in the late summer, early fall, where the colony shifts to reproductives and the female queen produces males and females and other colonies do the same. And then the drones go crazy because they want to be able to uh, deposit their sperm into the female queens. This, here's a successful drone 
doing you know a good job in you know releasing the sperm and remember that sperm will be hold inside the spermatica so so these female queens collect all the sperm from different males and the males as i explained before they will die after they mate so i'll go back to my powerpoint hold on hold on We've got it. Excellent. Lots of excited reactions coming in in the chat. Excellent. So this is another picture of a honeybee uh, because you know what you will see in these social behaviors is that you know these female honeybee queens attract all of these males, they're social, so they produce thousands of drones, thousands of new queens that get, you know, fertilized. But as I was saying, the majority of bees are solitary. So they also, you know, they don't produce as many drones, they don't produce as many queens because they're only, you know, individual bees. And a lot of them are, you know, the, the size of my um, little fingernail. Uh, but you will find them, you know, doing exactly the same thing. It varies when they do it, like carpenter bees right now will be mating. Uh, bumblebees will do it late in the summer. And during the whole summer, you will see a lot of these little native bees doing that. This is bumblebee mating. Uh, and in the majority of the solitary bees, you know, the male bumblebee, the male bees are, tend to be smaller. And it's all to ensure that survival of, you know, uh, the species. And I wanted to quickly talk to you about one of my favorite examples of mating uh, behavior in bees. This is an orchid bee. Uh, orchid bees uh, only live in the tropics of Latin America, Central and South America. You will see the big long tongue. This is a male orchid bee. And these bees are really, really unique. These are the males. You can see these big, big legs. And this is not to collect pollen. You know what they collect in here? Oils. They collect oils from the orchids and they create these incredible perfumes to attract females for when they mate. And, and these bees are just, you know, they have this incredible coloration. A lot of them match some of the fantastic orchids that they get to pollinate. So, but we have, you know, a huge diversity of bees. This is a little, you know, uh, propaganda for this book, Backyard, uh, Bees in My Backyard, that, you know, if you're interested, you can learn more about them. And if you want to learn more about native bees here in Colorado and what can you do in your garden, uh, we're going to have a program in our Facebook Live at the museum We've been doing all these science uh, programs at noon um, during the week, so you can come and learn more about that. But bees are just super exciting, super, you know, I bet many of you didn't know that we have such a great diversity of native bees here in Colorado. Thank you. Thank you, Gabby, that was wonderful. I'm gonna stop your share and I'm going to bring all of us back into gallery view. Um, we did get a lot of really excited reactions during your presentation. Um, and I have to say, I feel like if male humans died after copulating, Tinder would be a very different experience. <laughs> uh, I think that would be a, a, a wild thing um, if our species did that. Uh, real quick, before we move on to our final portion of the evening, which is hearing some poetry from the lovely Franklin Cruz, um, I do see some questions uh, for both you and Garth in the chat. So Garth, I hope you're still with us. We'll have you turn your video back on. Um, and this is, I knew this was gonna happen. Um, we have several people curious, do bees have penises and vaginas? <laughs> uh, well, they, they're not called penises and vagina. Uh, like I show, you know, you probably remember that diagram that I showed you with the ovaries and the spermatica. So there is an entrance uh, for, you know, the sperm to go in for the penis uh, so to speak, uh, of the of the male bee into the female. 
Uh, but then, you know, we don't call them that way. We usually just, you know, we're more polite in the big world. Uh, you know, we call them reproductive systems. So, but That's yeah, a technical term. They do exactly the same, you know, the same function. Interesting stuff. Um, two questions about bees that are related, and then I have one for Garth about birds. Um, Andrew is wondering, I've previously thought that only queens could reproduce. Is that not true, or is it just queens that are reproducing? Well, in honeybees, queens are the only ones that can reproduce. But remember, in solitary uh, colon, in solitary bees, you know, there's not a queen, it's just, it's just, you know, a worker queen bee, so she's able to reproduce. And so that way, you know, thanks to that, she can continue you know, to create new little bees. But really, the only ones that have queens are bumblebees, bumblebees queens. And you probably are seeing in them right now a lot of these big bumblebees that are flying in our yards, trying to find places to nest because they have been hibernating all winter. And they're big because they're full of eggs, getting ready to lay them. So only the social... Uh, bees are able to, you know, to have queens, so to speak, but Makes only bees to reproduce. Makes sense. Um, and then one more question related to queen bees, um, which Gabby is our queen bee at the museum. That's <laughs> a little thing I like to say, sucking up, it's all right. Uh, if a queen bee makes her own drones, how do bees get genetic diversity? No, they make drones, but you know, during that time where, you know, the, the are making, are shifting towards producing males and females, other colonies in the area are doing exactly the same thing. So during the nuptial flight, the queens are mixing with all sorts of, you know, other males from other colonies. So it's very rarely that you will see them, you know, mixing, you know, among the same individuals. And a lot of people that have done research in honeybees and you know, and some of you probably that I've seen in the in the chat, uh, you know, you tag, you can tag your little bees with little numbers, and you can see who is mating with which. So, so no, so these colonies, there's a lot of genetic diversity. Interesting. Um, having spent a lot of time in middle school classrooms in my education career, I can I can say middle schoolers are kind of the same. You can just sort of see who uh, who mm -hmm. likes who. So middle schoolers mm -hmm. and bees are similar in that way. Uh, one more question uh, and then we will move on. Uh, Garth, we have Joshua and Leslie wanting a reminder about what was the polyandrist waterfowl that you mentioned? There are three species here in Colorado. Uh, those are phalaropes. How do you spell that? It starts with a P-H and not an F. Okay. P yeah, P-H-A-L-A-R-O-P-E-S. All right, there you have it. All right, and then one more comment because this one's just so good. I think this is what I saw Franklin snapping about just a second ago. Um, our participant Ashley wins the internet this evening uh, because in response to Gabby's comment about bee reproductive anatomy, she says, so there's no Venus." <laughs> and for that, that's Ashley, a good one. <laughs> you have my un undying respect. <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. All right. Well, for our last thing this evening, uh, we do have um, a few minutes of poetry with Franklin. Um, and in the interest of time, we do want to wrap up on time and don't go too long. Um, I think we are going to skip um, having you all write your own poetry, but Franklin is brilliant. And so Franklin, I bet you could write up the instructions that you were going to give everyone verbally and send them to me so that we can send it to everybody who registered tonight. I know while well, we see Andrew saying no, so actually let me stop talking and we'll see how much time we have, but we don't want to go too far because we know you have an evening to get back to. So Franklin, I'm going to spotlight your video. Take it away. Well, good evening, everyone. I hope that y'all have had a fantastic evening. I've been dying over here at y'all's comments, and I know you can't see them, but I'm being thoroughly entertained. So much appreciated on that end, because, you know, I'm having a great time. Um, I'm going to jump into some poems, because, again, like Talia said, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, if you are interested in following me, um, I do work for the Science Museum as a science educator, but I also have a poetry career outside of the Science Museum. Um, and I do appreciate the Science Museum for highlighting poetry because um, I think it's a wonderful intersection for science and arts to meet together. So um, I'm actually gonna read one poem that's not mine real quick and then one poem that is mine since we're talking about spring and spring fling in love. Um, this is narrator or contemporary narrators from the Northeast of Mexico. 
um, and the selection I'm reading is a writer named Reina Castro Hernandez. Um, and I'll read it in Spanish first, and then I'll do a quick translation for y'all. So, La Mujer del Espejo. Sí, tengo un romance. Jamás pensé llegar a enamorarme así. De pronto me reencontré con esa persona, la única capaz de hacerme realmente feliz. La miré como nunca antes, llena de virtudes, una inmensa ganas de amar, de amarme. No ignoré sus errores, simplemente los entendí y perdoné. Tampoco me enfoqué en ellos, como antes. Tiene tantas cosas buenas para dar. Ahora es tan claro, sus sueños, sus ilusiones, sus anhelos, sus temores, sus angustias y luchas. Todo la hace tan especial. Sí, la amo. Amo profundamente a esa mujer del espejo. Me he reencontrado con esa parte de mí que oculté en una, en una búsqueda errónea de la felicidad externa. Me estoy reinventando y es fascinante lo que voy descubriendo de mí, de lo que soy capaz. Me dirigió a mi may mayor felicidad y real real realización. Y como siempre, mi Padre amado va conmigo, delante de mí, abriendo las puertas correctas. Me amo y soy feliz. Um, so the quick translation is, yes, I have a romance. Uh, I never really thought I would fall in love like this. Suddenly, I found myself again with uh, that person, the only one capable of making me truly happy. I looked at her like never before, full of virtues and an immense urge to love, to love me. I did not ignore her errors. Simply, I understood them and forgave them. Neither or neither did I focus on them. Like before, she has so much uh, good to give. And now it's clear, her dreams, her illusions. Oh my God, sus anhelos, I almost forgot. What is anhelos, one more time? <laughs> when translating on the spot. Gabby, do you have it? Oh, yearning. Gosh. Yeah, her, her dreams, her illusions, her yearning, her fears, her anguishes, her, uh, her fights everything that makes her so special. Yes, I love her. I love her profoundly, this woman in the mirror. I have refound my, I refound that part of myself that was occulted in this erroneous search for external happiness. I'm reinventing myself. And it is fascinating what I have rediscovered about me and what I am capable of. I have directed myself, oh, it has directed me to my best happiness and realizations. And like always, my loving father is with me ahead of me, opening the correct doors. I love myself and am happy. That so. was fantastic. Thank you for reading that in two languages and translating on the fly. That is no small feat. Uh, lots of comments in the chat saying snaps and so beautiful and saying that you have a voice born to read poetry. All I'll right, so. let's hear one poem from you and then we did get some comments saying you know what we would hang on for a little bit more so you know what let's have folks uh could you lead everybody through coming up with one metaphor i think that was what you wanted to lead folks through right absolutely cool. one metaphor so, um, about love this next poem i'm sharing is essentially along the same lines of loving yourself um i wrote this poem before i found this and then when i found this i was like perfect unity um so this is my version of loving yourself on the days you are your own worst enemy. Laugh loud, even if you do sound like a hyena. Sometimes it feels like the world is rushing us to succeed and asking us to adult, as if anybody has any clear idea on how to actually adult. So when you find yourself making less than the best choices, crack open a can of nostalgia, laugh at your most socially awkward moments like the time that I was actually caught naked in front of family. <laughs> Remember that stress and the struggle the mountain that as you got older somehow grew into a prairie dog hole. Be the friend who's brave enough to jump in and strong enough to come out with you. Be your own best friend who saw you hatch from the egg, grow wings, fly straight up into the sun, roast your own skin and fall. Be there when you are shish kebab by the prongs of fate and circumstance. Don't panic at your busted frame. Love yourself enough to rebuild yourself. Love yourself enough to get wild with yourself. Love yourself enough to get hype with yourself. Love yourself enough to reenact X-Men with yourself. 
love yourself enough to cook naked for yourself. Love yourself like you can love your family. Show them how you can grow wings over and over again. Love yourself like you could love your heroes, the ones who don't even know how great they are. Love yourself like you don't even know how great you are. Like everything that happens to you happens on purpose and nothing was a mistake. Not even the booby trap and the pitfall. Succeeding can be easy, but learning to love yourself along the way is why we need friends like ourselves. So be your own Justice League Unlimited. Soup into your own head or imagination and say all the stupid shit you want. Hell, say it out loud and then back yourself up. Show yourself you love yourself enough to be un- Oh, I'm just making myself up. Ah, when you are doing poems on the, on the spot. Oh, why we need friends? Right? Um, your own justice. Oh, be your own partner. Oh, there, there's the way it is. Be your own Justice League Unlimited. Swoop into your own head or imagination and say all the stupid shit you want. Hell, say it out loud and then back yourself up. Be the kind of friend who would help you plot out a theoretical crime spree. Be the kind of friend who's okay with busting out at a nightclub. Be the kind of friend who would let you crash out at your house or at their house if you ever lose your house or your car or your weight or your heart. Allow yourself to germinate the way that you're supposed to. Grow again like arboles de piñones. Water your own roots. Trim your own branches. Sculpt your own crown. Be the kind of friend who you would end up marrying. The kind that would make you laugh over stupid things like waffles and cry over nerdy things like Star Trek and love you in all the right ways like forever wouldn't even be long enough. Love yourself like forever wouldn't even be long enough. Like even after you die, you would love your spirit wherever it ends up, we should have always been doing in the first place. Thank y'all. That was absolutely beautiful. Lots and lots of chats coming in saying snaps and saying thank you. Um, folks, we do recognize that it is now 901. And so we are sure that you have exciting things to get off to this evening. Uh, for me, it's just headed out to the, heading out to the living room for another my exotic travel for the evening. Um, but if you do want to hang on, Franklin does have a quick exercise that he can walk us through um, so that you can maybe come away with your own little love poem to tell yourself or tell someone that you love this evening. Um, real quick, Franklin, before we move into that, uh, we have a request to repeat the name of the poet uh, that you read um, a poem for. So it is Reina Castro Hernandez, and she is from um, let me see what part of Mexico she is from specifically, because she is from the north. Oh, Chihuahua. So she's from the uh, uh, south of the Chihuahua. Um, but yeah, Reina Castro. Hold up the book. Can you show us the book to the screen so that if someone wants to... Oh, I don't to... know if that's going to help y'all. It's all mirrored. But, I see this is um, fine on my screen. So take a screenshot, everybody, or write it down real fast. Um, but yes, if you are game to hang on, um, if... Franklin will uh, walk you through another poetry exercise, um, but we can at this point say a big thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, it was so great to have you tune in. Uh, June 12th is our next one of these events. Again, we are piloting this series and we are hoping that you will join us again in just a couple of weeks. Details will be posted at dmns.org, so stay tuned. Um, and a big thank you to all of our panelists. A uh, round of applause for Patrick real fast, or some snaps for Patrick. A round of applause or some snaps for Garth, thank you for that. A uh, round of applause or some snaps for Gabby. And then wherever Harley is, thank you for that wonderful video up to the sky. Harley, we appreciate you. All right. If you need to leave us at this point, we understand. Otherwise, Franklin, take it away for one last quick exercise before we say goodnight. Cool. So this exercise is going to take um, literally two minutes. If you have not gotten some to write on, even your computer, um, please do so real quick. Um, I always encourage writing on anything that's available to you. So you, if it's at hand, it, trust me, it's going to be one line. So it's not going to be something to lose really easily. And I would love to see people post these um, anywhere and just see what you guys got so we can share them. So if you haven't ever done a metaphor uh, or written creatively, it's perfectly fine. Um, all I'm gonna instruct you to do is follow three easy things. So number one, um, when doing anything artistically, just suspend your judgment for the initial part. After when everything's out, go ahead and like edit. But for the first part, just let things fall out of your brain and your mouth. Number two, is um, whatever pops into your brain first, trust that. Um, your brain usually knows what it wants to say. And then it's just our ego who gets in a way. It's like, no, there's a prettier way to say that. No, your brain already chose. So trust that first. Um, and then the last one too is if you just feel inspired, by all means, go. Cool?
So we're gonna um, do a metaphor of love. Um, metaphor, the easiest definition is this just a comparison. Um, so if it's uh, a metaphor about me and my future, right? Futures are bright. My future is as bright as the sun. My future is as bright as a volcano exploding. My future is as bright as a child's smile. Three different metaphors where I'm just comparing my future to anything bright, right? It's just, again, the first things that popped into my brain. Some people are like, but volcanoes are destructive and everything. But I'm like, have you seen a lightning storm on a volcano? That's pretty bright. So um, again, just trust yourself. So um, you're gonna make a list of three things and that's gonna be it. Number one um, on your list, I need you to choose um, anything in the natural world, a rock, animal, whatever, and just put it on the list. Number one, anything from the natural world. I'll give you about 10 seconds to finish that up. Specifics is great. So like B Gabby said, if you're gonna do some bees, there's a bunch of different kinds of bees we learned about. Get specific, which kind? Same thing for birds. All right, number two, right? If your love was a place, what uh, what would what would be that place? So choose a place, something that like is amazing. Hawaii, maybe your living room. Maybe it's specifically like the corner of your living room, right? Um, but choose a place. So a place that's super meaningful to you. Give you a couple seconds to finish that out. Cool. And number three. So number three is gonna be a type of uh, weather. So um, you guys can choose like a sunny day. And again, get specific. Is it a sunny day in Boulder versus a sunny day in Pueblo? Cause those are two different kinds of sunny days. Is it a sunny day on the beach or is it a sunny day in the mountain? I personally like overcast days, not gonna lie. I like overcast days in the mountains. So type of weather. And again, get specific. And friends, you should have three things. Number one, something from nature, anything. Number two, a place, right? And then number three, um, you should have a type of weather. And the easiest thing you're gonna do is you're just gonna say, my love is whatever that thing is, right? So my love is an overcast day in the mountains with my friends. My love is, oh, I have to do this one in my head. I'm improvising real quick. Number two was, oh, place, oh, my love is the kitchen table on Saturday nights with games all over, right? Um, number one was uh, my love. Oh, this is really fun. My love was the gopher snake that surprised me and my sisters on a hike, right? So those would be my three. So that's all you got to do is say my love is whatever you wrote down. And if you notice, I added more details. So by all means, go ahead. But use those three as an anchor for inspiration. So you already know what you're talking about. Now, it's just making a little bit more details. Yes! Someone just wrote, my love is a bright yellow dandelion. My love is a flat gray cloud. See, that's what I'm talking about. My love is hovering and spitting. Oh, that's cute. I don't know why you're hovering and spitting, but I'm personally moved by it. But I hope you guys had fun. And I guess I'm going to turn it back over to Talia. Very good. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, if you would like to, you are actually welcome to email us, tweet us, put it in your Instagram story, whatever you want your love poem. Uh, we would love to see what you came up with. Um, that was a beautiful exercise. Um, I know that our two experts this evening, uh, yes, thank you for the reminder. There is in fact a hashtag that you can use, hashtag DMNS Science Party. If you want to use that hashtag anywhere on your public social media, we will see it. So that's a great way to make sure that we see whatever you've got. Um, our two experts for the evening did have to bow out. Uh, Garth had to go put the kids to bed and Gabby I guess she's got some bees to tend to, and it looks like Patrick is cleaning up the kitchen. So that means it is officially time for us to put science to bed for the evening. But it was so wonderful to have you all with us tonight. Again, tune in on June 12th. That will be the next one in our series. It was great to have you. I learned a lot. I laughed a little bit. Um, thanks, everybody. And I'm going to go make a delicious cocktail in honor of Patrick. Cheers, everybody.